Hello and welcome to topic three of advanced financial accounting. This topic will cover investment in equity and debt securities. So investment in equity or debt, uh, when we are talking about these investments, we are essentially referring to passive investments where the intention uh, of making the investment is to earn an additional rate of return. And if so, IFRS 9 will apply to the accounting of such investments. A little bit more on the accounting for passive investments. It depends on the type, whether the investment is made in the equity of another company, i.e. common shares or preferred shares, or in debt issued by another company, which would typically be bonds, and the intention behind making the investment, whether the intention is to hold on uh, to the investment for the long run, or if it has been purchased for trading, i.e. a short-term investment. So based on the type of investment, <laughs> and the intention, we can have various possibilities. If the intention is to hold the investment for trading purposes, i.e. the company is not averse to the idea of selling the investment if it were profitable, then ideally it should be accounted for as fair value through profit or loss. If on the other hand, it were a debt investment, so a purchase of bonds issued by another company, and the intention behind making the investment was to hold it to maturity, long-term investment, then ideally we should be using amortized cost as the accounting model. Now, amortized cost is not available for equity because there is no maturity date for common shares or preferred shares. Now in the middle, you would notice that uh, a company may intend to make a long-term investment, but is not averse to the idea of selling the investment should the need arise, or should it be profitable to do so. In that case, for an investment in bonds, it's recommended that the company choose fair value through other comprehensive income, fair value through OCI as the accounting model. In the case of equity, the fair value through OCI model is available, but it has to be an irrevocable election in the sense that the company cannot change its mind later on and switch from the FVOCI model to say the F fair value to profit or loss model. But once that decision is made for an investment in shares, it cannot be changed. Let's take a look at a decision tree to help us figure out how uh, to choose the appropriate accounting model. This decision tree is taken from Intermediate Accounting Volume 1 by Beachy et al., published by McGraw-Hill-Ryerson Limited. So if we were looking at a bond investment, we should ask the question, are we interested in receiving contractual cash flows? So for bonds, there's periodic interest payments, coupon payments on specified dates. And when the bonds mature, we get back the principal. So if that is our only intention, then we ask a secondary set of questions. Is the objective to receive cash flows of the principal and interest only? And if the answer is yes, then the bond investment should be accounted for as amortized cost, or AC. If our answer is, Yes, our objective is to receive cash flows from principal and interest, but we may have to sell the bonds before maturity, should the need arise. 
Well, in that case, it's more appropriate to use fair value through OCI. If the answer to the original question was no, we are not, we do not intend to receive contractual cash flows only, then the appropriate model is fair value through profit or loss. Now for investments in shares, the question is, are these shares being held for trading? Is this a short-term investment where we are expecting a sudden or in the short term an increase in the price of the shares when we will sell them and book a profit? So if our intention is to trade in these shares, then fair value through profit or loss is the appropriate model. If that is not our intention, we do not intend to hold onto these shares for trading, i.e. it's a long-term investment, then we would ask ourselves, do we wish to make an election? Do we wish to choose to recognize the gains and losses on these shares in other comprehensive income, keeping in mind that it's an irrevocable choice. It cannot, we cannot change our minds later on. If we say, yes, we do, then we will apply fair value through other comprehensive income. If we say, no, we do not wish to make that choice, then we automatically are reverted to fair value through profit or loss. Let's take a closer look at investments in bonds. For investments in bonds, there are three possible accounting models available, amortized cost, fair value through OCI, and fair value through profit or loss. The initial recognition under all three models is cost. So whatever the investment cost. Normally, there are no transaction fees such as commissions or brokerage fees involved when we purchase bonds. So typically, whatever price we paid to buy the investment in bonds is the cost. Now, on bonds, we will typically receive coupon interest payments. These coupon interest payments that are received from the investment are recorded in net income using the effective interest rate method. That's the IFRS requirement. ASPE allows the use of straight line amortization, but we will focus our attention to the requirements under international financial reporting standards. And under IFRS, under both the amortized cost model and fair value through OCI, any interest income received is recorded using the effective interest method. The requirement is the same under fair value through profit or loss, but the usual practice is to record income equal to the coupon payments. On the balance sheet, under amortized costs, the investment is reported at amortized cost. You will prepare a bond amortization schedule if the bonds were purchased, not at face value. So sometimes we may have bought the investment at a premium or at a discount. In either case, we will prepare a bond amortization schedule for, to amortize the bond discount or the bond premium. And on the balance sheet, the investment in bonds is reported at amortized cost. Under both the fair value method, fair value through OCI, as well as fair value to profit and loss, the investment is reported at fair value. Now for bonds, fair value is calculated using the market rate on the date of the calculation. So you would typically do a remeasurement of the bond investment at year end, and you'll use the market rate at that time. The 
contractual cash flows will be used as inputs. So the bond's face value will be the FV. The coupon interest payments will be the PMT. The number of payments remaining will be the N. I by Y will be the market rate at the date of being of the calculation. And then you will compute PV of those cash. And that will become the fair value to be reported on the balance sheet. Now, of course, that could trigger a fair value gain or loss. That fair value gain or loss is report reported in other comprehensive income for the fair value to OCI model and in net income under the fair value to profit and loss model. Note that we do not do a fair value adjustment under the amortized cost model. So the fair value gain or loss bit is not applicable. Now, if these bonds were sold before maturity, any realized gain or loss will be recorded in net income under amortized cost. Also under fair value through profit and loss. For the fair value through OCI model, the realized gain or loss is also recorded in net income and the accumulated other comprehensive income from previous years is also recycled through net income. Okay, so you will record a, an adjustment to the OCI to close out accumulated OCI and report a gain or loss in net income. With regards to impairment, that is only applicable under amortized cost. Here, the recoverable amount of the investment is taken to be the present value of revised cash flows using the original effective rate. And if the PV of the revised cash flows using the original effective rate ends up being lower than the bonds, the investment carrying amount, then the difference is the impairment loss. That impairment loss is included in net income. For the fair value to OCI and the fair value to profit or loss models, because the investment is adjusted to fair value every year, the notion of impairment does not really apply. Next up, if we look at investments in equity, there are two possible models. The fair value through OCI election is irrevocable and is only available when the investment happens to be a long-term investment. Otherwise, the default model is fair value through profit or loss. So initial recognition is at cost. You have to keep in mind that when we purchase shares, there are usually transaction costs involved, such as commissions, brokerage fees, and such like. Those transaction costs are added to the cost of the investment under fair value through OCI. However, under fair value through profit or loss, transaction costs are expensed. They are not added to the cost of the investment. On shares, you, we may receive dividends. So such dividends are included in net income under both the FVOCI and the FVPL models. On the balance sheet, we report the shares at fair value and fair value simply the number of shares multiplied by the market price of the shares purchased. Now, if we had purchased the shares of a non-listed company, an unlisted company, then we may have to figure out a way to determine their fair value. That just makes things a little bit difficult. The fair value gain or loss is recorded in other comprehensive income for the FVOCI model and in net income under fair value through profit or loss. If the shares are sold, then any realized gain or loss is reported in OCI. Now this is different for 
investments in shares than it was for investments in bonds. So you have to make this, keep this in mind that contra contrary to how we had dealt with the realized gain or loss for investments in bonds, for investments in shares, the realized gain or loss is reported in other comprehensive income under the FVOCI model. And we are not allowed to recycle the accumulated other comprehensive income through net income. So what do we do in that case? We have two choices. We can either leave the accumulated OCI balance as is, or close it directly to retained earnings. For the FVOCI bond investments, we were required to close the accumulated OCI through net income. So we were required to recycle. Here for investments in shares, that is specifically not permitted. For the fair value to profit or loss investments though, any realized gain or loss flows through net income. And because shares are adjusted for fair value, there is no concept of impairment. That concludes the video lecture on passive investments. We will go through examples in class. Bye-bye.